All right. Before we rush straight ahead and try to implement a trend following strategy, I'm sure that many of you already have in mind some rules that you want to try out once you have the system in place. So I just wanted to include this chapter to have a more robust thinking about how you want to think about your trading strategies because markets are very, very competitive and unlike what YouTube streamers would have you believe, you can't just slap on some technical analysis indicators, right? You can't just slap on an RSI or a stochastic oscillator and hope that things are going to go in your favor because let's say you have a random rule and you just try it on, the, on some price data it's going to be 50-50. You're going to make some money and you're going to not make money some of the time. And if you have some data and you try a hundred different rules, one of them is going to be very, very profitable. But obviously that does not mean that going forward, that trading rule will be profitable because you have basically overfit your data. So in general, the trading data is, you need to treat it as a very, very precious resource because that allows you to have an unbiased test of forward performance. So generally, trading strategies can be split into inefficiencies and risk premiums. Uh, the analogy for inefficiencies is like it is picking up a dollar on the street. So if you're just walking along a cafe and you see, oh, there is $10 on the street, you can just pick it up and this will be very profitable in relation to the risk that you have to bear. So this is an, inef an inefficiency. But of course, you don't expect that $10 to be there every time you walk past because if someone else crosses the street before you and they're going to pick up that dollar before you. So generally, you can expect inefficiencies to be very temporary and also needs you to be very alert to these kind of opportunities that present themselves. Something that is a lot more likely to last for a long period of time is risk premiums. So risk premiums are compensations for taking on some form of risk. And the analogy is that you're picking up a dollar in the middle of a busy road. So there are cars going by and you see $10 lying down in the middle of the street. Now maybe you won't pick it up, but maybe someone else will come along and say, oh, I'm willing to take on the risk and I'm going to pick up this dollar. Is that a fair trade? No, I don't know because maybe if you do that enough, you're going to get hit by a car. So, but maybe over a long period of time, it could still be profitable. So if you're willing to take on some risk, then sometimes you're going to be compensated very well for it. And this is the idea of risk premiums. Now, when you buy a fire insurance or you buy life insurance, typically people don't expect to come away with profits, right? What they expect to do is to transfer some risk, some future risk onto the hands of the company that underwrites this insurance. And in general, you can expect a negative return on this insurance premiums and the company can expect positive returns on these premiums. Of course, here then I want to talk about the importance of risk management because when you're taking on this risk premiums, typically you're exposed to some form of risk because you're compensated for taking it on. So this is a feature of the risk premium. And a lot of times you're going to have very, very nasty left tail risk, right? So in this case, risk management and portfolio management becomes a very important factor. So let's talk about an example of a risk management for fire insurance. Now, suppose you have to insure five different houses. I would argue that the best way to insure these five different houses is to make sure that they are spaced far, far apart, right? Because if you're going to insure five houses that are very close together, when there is a fire, the fire spreads. And if they're very close together, they all burn down at the same time. And the builders or the owners of those buildings are going to claim at the same time. And you have to face a huge payout. And this is bad risk management. On the other hand, if you have one building in New York, you have another building in Singapore, you have another building in Boston, it's very likely that the, that the fire is not going to happen all at the same time. So this allows you to stay afloat. Your company won't have to face huge risks 
at any snapshot of time. So this is the idea of risk management. You want to make sure that if you're taking on some risk, they are uncorrelated as much as possible. And that is why risk management is very important when we are talking about risk premiums. Another example is the interest rate carry. The interest rate carry comes when there are interest rate differentials between uh, different currencies or different country bonds. For example, let's say Argentinian bonds have an interest rate of 10%. Let's say you can borrow against the yen at 1% and you can buy these Argentinian bonds and you're going to, you can expect to make a yield of 9%. But of course, what you are exposed to now is that the fact that these Argentinian bonds are more risky and you're also exposed to the currency movements. If either the default happens, then you're facing a huge risk, or if there's a currency movement, then obviously your return is going to be that interest rate differential versus the currency price movements. So here, the, jump, the example I gave was Argentinian bonds borrowed against the yen. A lot more examples of these risk premiums in markets, and uh, some examples of that are funding arbitrage in cryptocurrency markets, and the idea of market making. So, and trend following is an example of, I guess you can say, a mispriced risk premium. So what is the idea of trend following? The idea of trend following is basically that prices that tend to move in some direction tend to move in the same direction for some time. So here's the price chart. Here is time. Here is the price in time. And you're going to see some price movements. And the idea is that prices tend to move in one direction at the same time. So if price is going up, then, whoops, let's bring that back. So if the price is going up, it tends to go up. And if the price is going down, it tends to go down. Why does this work? Well, I'll not get into that argument, but you can just eyeball the price chart and you will see that this is true for prolonged periods of time. So there are times when trend following really persists and there are times when the markets are mean reverting and a trend following strategy would be not profitable. But there is extensive literature on trend following working and you can have a bunch of rules to quantify this. You can have moving averages, you can do breakouts, or you can have some other form of rules to quantify uh, prices moving in some direction and across multiple asset classes, including commodities, employment data, price data, foreign exchange data, especially in the past. And you can see that this idea is persistence across multiple asset classes for decades, right? And if you're interested in the literature of trend following, then you can, um, the very, very OG trend followers were this group called the Total Traders. You can check them out, but uh, we're not here to talk about the literature of trend following. We're here to talk about the, just the idea of it. And we want to talk about how you want to validate your idea. So how do you validate a good strategy? Typically, if you are a proprietary trading desk and you have a trading strategy, there is a number of steps you can take to try to validate these ideas. And uh, sometimes because of infrastructural limits or you have some limits on data, you're not able to apply one or a few of these points. But I just wanted to go through all of these ideas to make sure that you are equipped with the right tools when you have some ideas that you want to test. The first thing you want to do is to start with this framework and try to classify what kind of trading strategy you have. Is it an inefficiency or is it a risk premium? And this should also determine how fast you should try to build out your infrastructure to exploit them. Because if you have an inefficiency, then your urgency to build something out and try to profit from it is going to be significantly higher if you have a risk premium, then perhaps you should be focusing on the infrastructure and making sure that you are in it for the long term because you're going to be slapped around by the risk and you want to have good risk management in place.
but generally the idea of risk premiums is that you want to survive long enough so that uh, you can pick up this compensation for long periods of time. But yeah, you want to start with the framework. Another way to do that is to make sure that you have uh, a lot of literature on that. You can eyeball the price chart and you can sort of have some intuition for whether this works. You can also look at any papers that might have existed, whether people have come across this before, which actually turns out to be a really good thing if other people have come across this. A lot of strategies that actually work are things that other people have found out before. This is not a bad thing. It means that the thing really exists and there are people who make it their profession to make sure that they do this well and in a manner that allows them to extract profits from the market. Whereas if you have some very idiosyncratic rule that nobody has seen before, that is actually a bad thing in general because, well, it's very unlikely that you are the only smart person in this entire world who has come across this very specific rule. Now, another tool is you can use modeling and 90% of the models out there do not require some AI neural net to do to do the analysis. A lot of times, uh, simple regression will do the trick. We want to talk about. We want to talk about a little bit of regression. In the next lectures, this would be a different form of analysis from the back test. And last but not least, you want to validate your ideas before running it on price data directly. You want to validate the effect that you are trying to harvest in the regression model or models in general. And then you want to move on to the backtest. You try out your ideas on previous historical price data. And last but not least, you might want to have some hypothesis tests to make sure that um, what, are, what is the probability of obtaining this result from a statistical framework. We're going to focus, or we're going to briefly talk about regression, and uh, most of our lectures are going to cover the ideas on backtest. You can also find other lectures that I have on Syncific that talk about this hypothesis testing in more detail, and I've also lecture series on discussing funding arbitrage in significant detail. So. With that in mind, we're going to go to the next lecture and talk about the ideas of regression.